All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Harry and Seb Talks. Um, today we're talking to Cosmin. Um, this is our weekly chat where we're talking to agency owners. Last week we spoke to Sebastian. Uh, who's another host of the podcast this week uh, as I said we're talking to Cosman Cosman thanks for coming welcome to the show why don't you briefly tell everybody who you are and what you do thanks for having me I'm Cosmin Cosmin Costa I run a consulting agency for e-commerce specifically and only for e-commerce and what we do is uh, basically support entrepreneurs develop as in grow their e-commerce business from wherever they are to more multiples of, uh, of revenue and profit. And we do this through consulting uh, services on um, what we call a seven step uh, process, uh, starting from a strategy to how you build your team, how do you optimize your processes, commercial, financial, IT, logistics, everything you need for uh, e-commerce. And it is a process of improvement for a lot of entrepreneurs to to take their business to the next level very nice thank you very much Cosmin. Nice. so um i thought we would start off by going a bit back in time if you don't mind um Ooh. pretend we have a time <laughs> machine and we're traveling all the way back um and i i I'm, forgive me if i butcher the name of this but you went to the collegial national SF Sava High School, right? I did, I did. <laughs> yeah, you did your homework. <laughs> so this was my high school. Yeah, definitely my high school. Uh, really fond memories of uh, of that uh, time. And uh, this is basically when I started uh, kind of engineering, so computer science in programming. But then my life took me a bit away. I'm still in, into the IT world, but more on the business perspective of IT. Got you. It's, so, it's um, in Bucharest. Um, sorry to interrupt. It's in Bucharest okay, okay. Uh, College, or yeah, it's it's in Bucharest. Uh, yeah, it's a lot like a, a pride to to be part of this college. You know, there's competition between colleges. I, I and, know, uh, I know, I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> Once you join one of them, you're of of uh, clearly uh, away from the others. So uh, yeah, it's a really proud moment of my life and happy moment. Just as a side note, my, my daughter also follows uh, uh, the same college. So again, it makes me proud <laughs> of the other colleges. But it's just a friendly, yeah. I can, only, I can only imagine the trouble she would be in if she went to a comp uh, competing school. <laughs> <laughs> trouble maybe, but also a lot of fun of uh, poking around uh, yeah, her yeah. to me and me to her. <laughs> but let's see i have two daughters and let's see the other one which college joins because maybe it will be fun yeah i like that um so take us back to uh younger young young cosman at high school um what did what did he look like was he was he popular did he have a lot of friends were you like the quiet shy guy what 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 did it look like that is a good question i was definitely not popular so this was not, not my thing. Um, but I did okay. I mean, uh, I have my friends, but some kind of uh, uh, sideline of, uh, of friends, not the mainstream popular uh, guys or, uh, or girls. But it was a really happy moment. And doing like normal, I, I don't know what you guys did in high school. We did play a lot of uh, basketball. This is, was our thing. These sports, yeah, For me, football, a lot of football, football, huh? yeah. yeah, yeah. I think oh. um, I'm quite British, so it was cricket and uh, and football. Yeah, okay. I'm quite, quite, Nobody's quite perfect. The, quite the British <laughs> stereotype. <laughs> cricket, yeah, um, which is a, a very boring sport. You sit, stand at the edge of a field for five to ten minutes, hoping somebody's going to uh, knock a ball to you. But nine times out of ten, you're just standing there for the for the whole game. So. Yeah, not and the most a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But excuse my ignorance, but it's a little bit similar to baseball, to golf. I know you hit a kind of a ball with a kind of a club. I think the the main yeah, the main comparison you could put is is baseball, although uh, obviously baseball is very americanized and cricket is uh, uh, quite traditional, quite quite mm. an old sport, quite an old sport. But um 
uh, the, the, so yeah, uh, yeah. So normal guy, so got not, a couple of friends. Not on the, on the popular side, but really happy years of my life. Actually, uh, when when I joined the the university first year, I was so how can I say this nicely disappointed that I went back to the high school and told the, the guys just don't do something to stay one more year because this you're not gonna get the, <laughs> this happy life uh, in university which was and, of course eventually was wrong that you build new make new friendships but uh, at the beginning it's quite tough and um was uh was young cosman a good student or a naughty student or did you get into trouble at all uh yeah you're looking for the sensational but i guess no I was okay. My, my, my teachers would say I was not uh, so, so uh, laid back, but I guess I was uh, an uh, okay student from yeah, all perspectives. And um, did you know that in high school that you want, because you're, I would say you're, you can class yourself as an entrepreneur, right? So did you know in high school that you were an entrepreneur at that point, or were you still sort of just studying and finding your way a bit? totally entrepreneur so mm. that was not really um, a challenge for me uh, quite funny story is that my first entrepreneurial uh, initiative was to actually sell uh, fruits watermelon okay. in the in the market mm -hmm. which i got from my um, not parents it's uh, you need to edit this, but how you call your parents' parents? Grandparents. Uh, grandparents. Yeah, sorry, yes. Yes. Grandparents, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> from my grandparents. So I was selling a watermelon in, uh, from my grandparents. Yeah. And uh, it was the highest achievement of that summer. That after I sold them, I went and bought this, you know, a motorcyclist jacket, this special jacket that... Uh, leather jacket, you mean? Le yeah, le the leather kind of like jacket. Like a leather jacket that... Yes, of course, I had no motorcycle, but having that jacket means <laughs> a lot of... Everybody was thinking you have a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very nice, so, very nice. Yeah, but really a nice achievement feeling. Two, two days of selling watermelon and then buying this dream jacket. It was August, so I couldn't wear it, of course, <laughs> but <laughs> I had it. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, would you say that uh, that feeling inside of you that you knew that you could take a product, you could sell it, and then that could support your lifestyle excited you enough that you knew that it was like a pursuit that you wanted to try and follow? You could say so, but there was not a question in my mind. I mean, I wasn't um, waiting options. It was just a, a clear path. Of course, I had jobs like normal jobs, but I feel like they were just part of uh, a process. Sure, sure. Yeah. And then, and then after that, you went to the, uh, you mentioned it before, but the um, University of Polytechnic at Bucharest. Right? Indeed so, indeed so. I was studying electrical engineering, computer science. So it was a um, really tough university and quite long. It's five years of university to get your uh, degree and uh, i did i did not enjoy it but i did whatever <laughs> it, uh, but you finished it, it. yeah yeah in uh, in second to third year i had an opportunity to travel to us in a work and travel visa okay nice for a full summer work there and yeah, working uh, in, a, in a kids camp really fun activity and totally out of my my usual activities i was uh, how you call it, assistant chef helping the chef to cook meals for the kids and uh, yeah again a really really fun time of my life uh, from yeah, pure fun having fun perspective but also from uh, finding a new way of thinking a new way of working mm. in the mm. in the american people a new kind of work ethics different from ours Better, worse, you could argue, but for sure different. What, but really, really fine times. What, what year was it when you went to the US? It was 1999 mm -hmm. because I was fortunate enough to, 
to go up the twin towers and actually visit the top wow. floor wow. just uh, one year before uh, yeah the tragedy mm. yeah so and you were close to the new york city this, this i was i was i was working uh, the the camp uh, was uh, upstate new york mm -hmm. and then again uh, through some favorable <laughs> good circumstances i uh, managed to spend a couple of weeks in new york just to fill the city mm -hmm. and then a couple of weeks in uh, washington to fill the city mm -hmm. and it's a life-changing experience which i've never had i mean uh, it's it's been uh, how how was it for you i mean i know how bucharest looks like i'm also living there how was it when you first time came to new york and i don't know how how did it feel for you or what was from your point of view a big difference that you that you saw you could say that from architectural point of view of, or of overwhelming of a buildings point of view but otherwise in the hustle and bustle of the city and the tram and the underground it was quite uh, quite similar i mean crowded you know like any big city not not the great outdoors with, uh, with green pastures just really crowded and people busy and uh, you know a bit dusty a bit uh, yeah. uh, smoky from the from the traffic so not really a big difference uh, i didn't uh, feel that big difference the big difference i felt in the in the countryside so the camp was in a like a small city maybe 100,000 uh, inhabitants close to to it and uh, the the country life almost the country life that what uh, that's what i really liked mm. with the You know this these kind of things that you see in the movies, like there is a pub, like the the town pub, the the pub. Is that, yeah, that's it. Don't, yeah, <laughs> it's one pub, uh, the only pub, <laughs> the only pub. So it was uh, like a hundred thousand uh, inhabitant city, and we were like uh, next to it. And in the small town next to it, it was the pub and yeah. the store. So it was like this, but really, really good times. And being outdoors, yeah, I really enjoyed it. What a fantastic opportunity. Um, and something that kind of that you said about like uh, the American culture and their work ethic being a bit different. I've noticed from working with American clients, it's, it's very positive. It's very like happy go lucky. It's like, yeah, we can do it. We're the best. We're the best country in the world. I'd be interested to know from your perspective, because um, you're, you're obviously um, very, uh, you know, the Romanian culture because it, it is your culture. Um, yep. And what what did you find were the key differences when you went over in terms of like the way that they act and sort of work in comparison to the way that Romanians act and work? I would first thing I would say it's less complicated. So mm. more straightforward, more simple. When we work, we work. When we party, we party. Not <laughs> overthinking uh, stuff. And it felt natural. It felt like the, the way it should be. And the working was really hard, uh, but also the fun was really hard. So really not much time for in between. My, my actual schedule was really precise because of when you're a cook, you, are, you have a precise schedule, you need to cook <laughs> breakfast, yes. lunch, and dinner. And I woke up before everybody else, of course, to prepare breakfast, did breakfast, finish the breakfast, then just chill. Then lunch and then work out because I had the opportunity to, to work out a lot there because they had a really nice gym and yeah, I could eat all the protein I'd need <laughs> and <laughs> work out, which was really good for, for me and fun for me. And then in the evening, just like normal party, having a beer, really, really fun times. Amazing. And um, for our listeners who are listening, and obviously like traveling is like a thing that a lot of people say, would, would you recommend to do something similar, go to another country and live and experience it for a while? Totally. I was going to say that if you wouldn't uh, have asked me. Uh, I think it's really important to do that. And uh, this um, work and travel uh, kind of program, I think it's quite popular everywhere in the world or It was called actually student exchange or something like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's the same thing. You you go in another country for quite a long time, like a few months, and it change your changes your perspective. It would could have been anywhere actually, maybe to France mm -hmm. or to Spain or to Asia. But I think I was lucky because of it, it was US. Sure. 
So um, you came back from America, finished up your university degree. Um, and what was the what was the next step in in uh, Cosman's career, so to speak? Yeah, actually, before that, uh, it was a really important moment there in the U.S. Mm -hmm. because a lot of my colleagues just came to this work and travel opportunity just as a as a way to actually uh, stay in the U.S. to to move in U.S. and to have a, like a temporary visa and then get their permanent visa. And I was stupid enough to believe that, uh, yeah, anybody can make it in U.S. If I'm really <laughs> tough, I can make it back in, uh, in my home country, which was not a good decision. And uh, yeah, maybe I would take another pass now. But uh, I did come back and uh, did finish university. And then starting, actually, from the university, I started doing like the most uh, regular job of uh, IT student, and that is fixing computers and uh, installing Windows uh, nice. 95 for that age. And uh, yeah, all this computer uh, mm -hmm. stuff. Mm. And um, so after you finished your degree, um, did you go straight into a job or did you take some time off? What was the, the plan? So starting the second year out of five I was uh, employed in different forms, part-time or full-time during university, doing this, as I said, uh, regular uh, IT guy jobs. And then, uh, yeah, from the last year, uh, I started my entrepreneurial journey in different kind of environments, okay. from having a store, just uh, like a regular convenience store, so regular convenience store, to uh building uh, other types of business some related to it some not related to it but easily i was moving towards uh, uh, the e-commerce part actually e-commerce was coming to romania so if uh, if amazon was founded in 95 i guess mm -hmm, or something mm -hmm. 96 um, then 2000 uh, 2001 were just like the moment when we got our first email address. And then 2005, I started working uh, in e-commerce uh, fully. And that was the important uh, moment of my career, initially from IT perspective, so configuring online stores and um, IT stuff. Mm -hmm. And then more towards business perspective of e-commerce, which I'm yeah, happily still doing now. So um, just for the people who are listening, you in 2005, you were freelancing, creating online stores, or were you creating online stores for yourself? I was creating online stores for uh, the company that I was working for at the, the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I started building my own, own online store, and then it went from that. How, and... how was it at this time with the e-commerce? Because... I have a similar experience from when I did an online shop for nutrition in Germany. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember it was, there were so many problems and it was taking so much with optimizing it and so on. So what, what tools did you use? Or can you remember how this was when you started there with this e-commerce? What were the problems or the hassle? Mm -hmm. I remember, I think we were using Joomla. At that ah, yeah, moment. yeah, I remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we didn't have many problems with the e-commerce store itself, the front okay. end, the IT part. But of course, we had problems with traffic because the internet was not so <coughs> hype. And uh, yeah, we had a beautiful store, but then <laughs> waiting for traffic to come. And yeah, it was not so, so well developed, at least in my, my circle, all the techniques. To, to bring traffic, organic traffic, pay traffic. And then we started learning them and then we started uh, bringing uh, traffic. And of course you bring traffic and then, yeah, we got traffic. Now we need conversion. <laughs> 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 yes. And then you, the party goes on. When you were um, in the beginning of your career in 2005, so just left uni setting up e-commerce stores for the, your company and then your own online store, um, were there any uh, big lessons that you kind of learned early on that kind of made you go or mistakes you made that were like, wow, 
this is like a really big learning opportunity mm. yeah that's that's an interesting question um i think it was the, that it was a time when i learned that product data is the toughest thing to do when you do e-commerce uh, of course, it's tough to get traffic, it's tough to get conversion because this, that's the game. But that, that, uh, in that time, I learned that before you do anything about your e-commerce store, you should start documenting product data, like title, description, uh, photo, video, whatever uh, yeah, digital assets you can pull off and filters and variants and everything, because it's always it takes always longer than you would expect sure. to, to get this uh, this done and it never ceases to amaze me although in all my consulting projects in the last uh, 15 years knowing that i started with that okay strategy it we're gonna do that but first let's do product data and have a couple of, <laughs> of i don't together. know students working on this uh, you know this huge spreadsheet of uh, of product data and uh, making it uh, right and copywriters to write the descriptions so Maybe a small thing, but really important uh, and time consuming. Mm. And it's really important, I guess, to have all of the ingredients together before you make the recipe. And that's kind of what you're saying here. Have all the prerequisites done, planned, prepared. Yeah, from my point of view, the planning is key. Mm. So I'm an engineer, which helped me a lot in my professional life. Because engineering means uh, process, means planning, means structured approach. And uh, if I would say something about my business success is due to this, this legacy from engineering, mm -hmm. process, planning, structure. If I um, said to you the words uh, metro, cash and carry, what, <laughs> could, what could you tell us about that? I would say good professional learning, a lot of professional learning. I thought I knew e-commerce, I can say that because in the interview I said, I know everything about e-commerce. <laughs> <But then, laughs> I knew I said thought e-commerce, but I didn't. And uh, I did it anyway, the e-commerce e uh, part of Metro, which was actually uh, building the first e-commerce in the Metro Cash and Kelly world, which is quite a big uh, company in a big uh, world. And uh, I was lucky enough to be chosen to lead this project in Romania. And Romania was lucky enough to be chosen to be the pilot country for this e-commerce project, which made me very happy and make me, made me meet a lot of really smart guys. And from those guys, there are two of them that uh, really stand out, maybe three of them. Uh, one is a uh, British guy who was my mentor in e-commerce and from which, from whom I, I learned a lot about e-commerce, how you do e-commerce properly and structured. And uh, the other one was uh, a Romanian guy who taught me about being nice to your team and uh, being a human uh, even in, in stressful situations. And the third guy, which I hated the most, was a Swiss guy. And <laughs> he just kept pushing me, like pushing me forever to do more and better and harder and work. And I hated that guy. But um, now I, I really appreciate because uh, I learned a lot about work and doing things properly and work ethics mm. and uh, never stopping until uh, it's... Uh, it's done. You know, it's this saying in sports, you don't stop when you're tired, you stop when you're done. Mm -hmm. This was the, the, the mantra. And um, how important is it to, uh, was it for you to have these three mentors to kind of help you out? It changed my life. I mean, I was not a kid anymore. So this was happening in 2011, 12, mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Uh, I was not a kid anymore, but they changed my uh, my life for the better. Mainly every experience I had changed my life from from the better. Maybe it's something uh, yeah, something good. I'm just saying this without too modesty in my ability to pull good things out of what happens in in life, especially in professional life. 
that I learned a lot and uh, they changed me a lot. I can't really apply what the empathic uh, leader taught me. They, this is the toughest one to, to, for me to apply. Empathy is not my strong point because I'm a results driven uh, guy and uh, sometimes I use a bit too much pressure to, mm -hmm. to get the results. Sure, sure. Um, how long was the project? How long did, did it take this project? Because you said you were the pilot. So I'm wondering how many products were there and how long was, was this entire project? Yeah, so the project uh, was divided into natural parts, the go live part, going live part, which mm. took six months, and okay. the uh, growth part. Uh, I was part of the growth part for three years after I uh, we launched mm -hmm. so uh, but definitely it was more intense the launch the six months the initial six months were really Can intense imagine. and uh, after we launched then we we start started growing the the business but maybe even more we started exporting the business model to different other countries because the, that was the purpose of the pilot to to take the learnings and export them in different other countries. Mm -hmm. And we did so in, um, in Poland, in, for Russia and for uh, Netherlands, mm -hmm. which again were, were chosen by our headquarters to be the, yep. the, the next countries to, to follow. And it was quite a specific business model. It was a B2B business model selling uh, from the entire Metro Cash and Carry, which is like a retailer, but it's a B2B. Yeah, it's a cash and carry business. Um, selling uh, the office supplies part of it so wow. everything you need in, in an office which could be from paper for the printer or coffee or uh, uh, yeah. lightning bulbs and uh, everything you need in every office it doesn't matter what what you do you need some some stuff yeah, yeah. computers and so on and from a number of SKU perspectives I don't remember that well, but I think we were in the range of five to six uh, thousand uh, wow. SKUs uh, in the in the store. And a bit of the challenge was that some of them were food and some of them were non-food. And this brings uh, some VAT. complexity. VAT and also fulfillment uh, challenges. Of course, the food was dry food. Mm -hmm. Metro is any uh, FMCG uh, seller has three kinds of, of uh, uh, merchandise, this mm. uh, regular amb ambient, so-called ambiental temperature merchandise, which doesn't matter if you keep it, then it's refrigerated, and okay. then it's the, the frozen part. We are lucky enough not to have refrigerated, although we tried something with fruits for, for yeah. the office, because it makes sense to bring fruits to the office, and we had none of the frozen part. So it was mm. a bit simple, but still a bit challenging because you have food and non-food uh, items in the in the same basket. I see, and lots of product data. And lots of product data. This is, uh, yeah, yeah th this was uh, quite uh, really difficult. Mm. Really, really difficult to docu document everything. And yeah, we had a hybrid model. So we were keeping stock for some of the goods. We were uh, drop shipping the others and cross docking others. So quite a, complex uh, fulfillment scenario and it was mm -hmm. managed through a so-called LSP, third-party logistic. So the complexity was, uh, was really high to manage all these uh, stakeholders. I was about to say that it sounds like the, the biggest project possible and no wonder you had three mentors who are helping you out because I imagine to give somebody all of that complexity and just leave them by themselves can, can be quite tough, especially for somebody who... Um, is uh, still, at, I would say, at the beginning of your career or in the middle of your career, perhaps. Um, and I just wanted to know, um, considering it was such a tough project, was there ever any a point where you were like uh, thinking of giving up or wanted to leave? Yeah, thinking to to giving up uh, to giving up was uh, always on my mind. Thinking that I was gonna get fired was always on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I just kept uh, kept pushing, pushing uh, harder. Mm -hmm. um, it was there was no plan B because I was in a very masochistic way enjoying this this uh, this push because I felt Learning. that I was yeah I was growing as a professional. For somebody who might be struggling to 
continue on um, forward with something that's as difficult as it is. Do you have any tips or advice um, in regards to how you handled that stress and how you kept like a positive mindset to keep moving forward? I wouldn't know recommendations to, to manage stress, but I do have a strong recommendation for somebody in a similar position. Uh, of course, another layer of complexity was the, the management of corporate headquarters in Germany versus local uh, presence in uh, Romania or the mm. countries. Uh, but I would give this advice, this um, proper management of uh, different stakeholders from corporate headquarters to uh, local is one of the keys of uh, success. Your mm. success, personal su success as a professional, part of a big organization, but also the success of the project because there are so many stakeholders and interests in, in small things. Like I'll give you an example. So we were trying to do PPC. So Edwards at that time, and we said, of course, we're gonna do it because Edwards is really uh, language specific and you can't do it from uh, in a translation. It's crazy to do it via translation. Mm. And the corporate headquarters really pushed us to do it from Germany to so do PPC in Romania from Germany using and I quote some ladies that do know Romanian <laughs> for translations and I said yeah that's not post that's not okay totally not okay and it was one of the things that we we won let's say the country won and we managed to hire local agency to to do our PPC but uh, yeah managing this complexity in different many many regards who has the right to change something in the web shop from it perspective corporate oh, yeah. says yeah it's a corporate solution so we do it country says yeah but it's a local we need to make money with it you can't, can't just be there in your headquarters and uh, dream about it we need to provide to make the pnl so a lot of text tension and friction here. I, mm. I, I fully, I fully understand. <laughs> and I, I know this because we as an agency, we also work with big corporations and lots of them are from Germany and they have different perspective how things should go because the German market is different from the Romanian market. And there is a lot of back and forth with, um, especially in these big corporations about small things or just we need to give access to the, to the agency. Just takes sometimes three or four weeks. Oh, yeah, but indeed. the contract, the contract is already yes, contract is already running. So of course you're invoicing, but you weren't able to do anything. So it kind of feels like um, bad when you didn't do anything. Just got the access um, one week ago, and now you just worked one week. You know, and mm -hmm. um, this is exactly what I can relate to that this complexity, and especially for people that start young in an agency and have never worked like you or me in a big corporation, I worked at Telecom, they, they don't understand why things take so long. Or that, yeah. that for example, a, a company needs 60 days to pay you. Why, why do they need 60 days to pay you? How is this mm. even possible? This is mm. Exactly. When you're providing services, because it doesn't make sense. I mean, for yeah. goods, maybe there is a reason because there, there is a shelf time mm. there just waiting to be sold. But for services, yeah, I feel you. Another uh, maybe similar challenge is that sometimes people who make decisions are not necessarily knowledgeable about the topics that they decide about. Oh, yeah. For example, <laughs> <laughs> and for example, we of course wanted to use Google Analytics, but somebody says, no, Google Analytics stores data in US and we are an European company and this is a data privacy challenge. Mm. And we're gonna use, and I think we chose Omniture as a, as a tool. Mm -hmm. I think Omniture, it was a, an alternative tool. Mm -hmm. which is a very good tool, but nobody know, knew how to use it because it's <laughs> like, yeah, and really expensive tool. Anyway, the, these are the kind of, uh, of challenges you, you face. And I, um, I know after, after Metro, you did some work with Deloitte. And I know I was talking to Sebastian before the call and he was very interested to hear about what you did at Deloitte and, and how you helped them. Um, so my question, I guess, is what did you do at Deloitte and, and what was your role there? Let me just start by saying that it was the worst time of my career at Deloitte. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> but, it, but the position <laughs> sounded really well. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And what we did was uh, relevant and uh, yeah, bringing value to the customers. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much time uh, it passed, a few years if I'm out of the non-confidentially <laughs> agreement, but uh, it was not good times. I mean, the pressure there mm -hmm. from the top management uh, not to deliver which I was able to deliver e-commerce implementation yeah. consultancy, but to sell it, it was just too much and it didn't make sense. Uh, I, I went there on a proposition or proposal that I, I'm going to be in charge of the e-commerce uh, uh, implementation and consulting services. And I realized not so fast, but eventually that I was just a seller. I was just a, how you call it? A salesman, a salesman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 My, my job was to sell, not to deliver. And I'm an engineer. I like to deliver stuff. My sales <laughs> skills are quite, uh, quite low. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. For example, I was part of SAP team uh, in a way of working like an external, uh, external partner. And there, my job was to uh, do the technical match to the business requirements. So matching technical specs of the solution mm -hmm. to business requirements of the customer. And I loved that job because somebody else was doing the selling and I was in charge of making things happen for the customer. So I have a technology and I was matching it with the needs in order for the customer to make money, mm -hmm. which is like perfect job. But for me to sell... It's not okay. And sure. this is <laughs> what I was supposed to do there. Was there a um, point where you just sort of was sat there and you were like, yep, I'm, I'm done with this now. And it, was there like a light bulb moment where you were like, boom, I'm, I'm going. Yeah, again, for the sensational part of our discussion, maybe it would help, but it was just uh, after one year that I realized I don't belong here and no hard feelings, but... It's just I don't belong here. I had a one one year contract, and uh, yeah, we found a way to to end it. I think not even one full year, maybe eleven months, and uh, I was out of there. So, yeah, it sounds also kind of strange, like to put like one person to do two different positions, like what you said, implementation and selling. From my point of view, you need different skill sets, and to find somebody to has both of these skill set, I think it's really rare because either you are good in selling and so on, or either you are really technique, you know, technology and you know how to implement things. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to, <laughs> to justify my misfit with uh, a big four no, I'm company. Just thinking, I'm just thinking from my team or also on other teams that I've worked and I saw these different types of people that work in sales and these people that work for implementation and technology and yeah, I think it's like different different positions and mm. you need, I mean, if you want to be a good salesman, you need to make another studies and another seminars training than somebody that wants to implement things in e-commerce. It's like two different paths from my point of view. Yeah, just, but yeah, it was not, so I, I went to five times in my career, mm -hmm. as I told you, but this was tough and not helping. Some others were tough and helping. Yeah, I think also sure, demotivating. Sure. And yeah. and what what happened after that? So when you this a eleven months were over, so what were what was your plan? I think you made also some plans. What will happen after that? Yeah, actually, I had plans before because uh, for a long time I started my my consulting business for okay. e-commerce, mm -hmm. and uh, then. Uh, Deloitte came and said, uh, yeah, we want to launch the Central European uh, practice, uh, which is Deloitte Digital. Mm -hmm. And we would like to focus on a certain technology, which at the time was an uh, SAP e-commerce technology called Hybris. And uh, I had the opportunity to be the guy who knew Hybris in the region and mm -hmm. maybe also have certain uh, seniority to be able to talk to a, a board member to and convince that it makes sense to, to do e-commerce right. 
Hmm. Is this and is this hybrid still on the market? I, I haven't heard that SAP has some kind of like e-commerce. Yes. Uh, my knowledge is limited on, on the future of uh, what happened yep. after I left, but Hybris itself uh, was uh, a Munich company who started building an e-commerce platform. It got really successful, an enterprise platform, so really only really big customers. Yeah. And then uh, SAP had a kind of uh, e-commerce platform, but not really. And they said, okay, instead of building a good one, let's buy, buy a good one. Yeah, the, the normal yeah. approach of, of a big corporation. And they bought hybrids. And then for about three, maybe five years, they started uh, mixing hybrids with their own technology. And eventually it's, it was not, or maybe it's not even hybrids anymore. It's called SAP e-commerce or SAP mm -hmm. commerce. Yeah. The, the brand is, it's gone. But yeah, from my perspective, the hybrid days were the fun days. And now it's SAP as a big corporation, so maybe not so so fun. Yeah, I, I see. So um, essentially, you're, from what I got from that, you're, you started consulting after Deloitte, is that correct? No, uh, I started consulting way before Deloitte, but sure, sure. and happily doing so. And then uh, a guy from Deloitte, a Polish guy, the, the leader of, of this, uh, Deloitte Digital uh, branch. Uh, he got, how do you say, he got a fix on me. He, he was crazy. He said, I must have you. Okay. Okay. And I said, no once and no twice and no third. And then, yeah, I said a number. And I said, yes, for this number, I'll join you. And he said, yes. Said, wow. What can you do then? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's give it a try. Yeah, let's yeah. give it a try. Yes, for this amount, it doesn't matter. I how mean, I mean, the out. compensation has to be high enough to suffer, and if it yeah, was like yeah. this, then yeah. So for me, for my my standard of living was unreasonable the amount, and he said, "Yeah, let's do it." Okay, wow. and let's do it. <laughs> but then I realized that I was hired for selling, not for delivering. And yep. it was the, the mm -hmm. yep. crash. So uh, after Deloitte, did you go full-time consulting? I just went back to my consulting. I mean, it was like nothing changed. I went mm -hmm. back to my consulting in different projects, different kinds of engagement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I work with uh, like a lot of small customers. Sometimes a big customer takes a lot of my, of my time, of my workload. But one of the most important projects after Deloitte was uh, Heineken, mm -hmm. which uh, got me to support them building the e-commerce, B2B e-commerce uh, sales platform. Mm -hmm. And it was, again, a really happy and uh, satisfying uh, time of my life because mm -hmm. it's, it's cool and nice to help an entrepreneur grow his business, sure. but it's way better to do it from scratch, to build it from zero, like it's supposed to be built. Sure. And that, that was the chance in Heineken. They had nothing and they said, we uh, build it from ground zero. So we could build it. We build it actually as it was supposed to be built. And it, it was really, be... really good. Con Congrats. And it was for an entire Europe or Romania or? Again, Romania was pilot for that, uh, that okay. initiative. And uh, there was a parallel initiative in UK and uh, maybe Netherlands also, something similar, but different business models. Mm. B2B in general, it's a complex business model with a lot of uh, stakeholders. Uh, and uh, we implemented one of business model and other countries, different business models, really mature approach from corporate headquarters to test business models in different countries to see how is this product market fit mm -hmm. of uh, business model and country specifics? Mm -hmm. But anyway, it went really well. And the, the, the building, the, the company, because it, it was actually an uh, independent company that we built, uh, was uh, in, in three years, it was um, half acquired by Coca-Cola. I mean, Coca-Cola joined and said, yeah, we want this, whatever you build, we're not going to build it again. We just want to to be part of this, and they bought half of that uh, of that company. Yeah. Well, I mean, big companies can do this. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious because you work so long in e-commerce, um, and I think all the people that are watching this this today 
are wondering what e-commerce platform are you recommending because there are so many <laughs> e-commerce platform outside and i know i know this is the you, most frequent question i i, I, get, I know so. and you, you, they will ask you probably all the time the same questions that you will say probably that depends <laughs> you cannot yeah of course of course i'm a consultant <laughs> everything depends but there is no no question no chat no coffee no beer that i have with a stranger that when I say I do e-commerce consulting that I don't get, what's the best platform? <laughs> and of course it depends, but it's not that complicated because this depends has really objective criteria, so you can select the platform. Mm. And uh, actually, as a side note, uh, I, I did a lot of articles. I wrote a lot, a lot of articles and uh, training courses and speeches about how to choose the best platform for you because it makes sense because everybody wants to know, know this. And the criteria are really, really uh, strict and precise, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, regarding the platform itself, which platform, regarding the type of platform, if it's a SaaS or an um, open source or how you host it and all this uh, technical stuff, mm -hmm. regarding what you sell, the products you sell, regarding your markets, regarding your team capabilities, uh, regarding integrations or not with marketplaces. So it's like, uh, it's a bit complex, but it's quite precise. Uh, you go through a decision tree and then uh, the right platform or at least a top three platform that would go well for you are, uh, are there. This is on one hand. On the other hand, there is a different uh, line of thought. That is, mm -hmm. which I kind of like actually, that is, yeah, they are not so different in the end, the e-commerce platforms. Mm -hmm. They all do pretty much the same. And whenever one of them is better, then it takes maybe six months that every other platform will do the same mm -hmm. or bring that new functionality. Some of them, some have some in inherent uh, flaws, like scalability where we are having challenge with Magento that was notorious for not, not being able to scale. But other than that, yeah, it's really uh, not much different mm. with, a, with a twist. The, the twist is, for me, if your business model is B2C or B2B. If it is B2B, which is maybe less popular, but way more complex, uh, and yeah, a lot of businesses are doing a lot of money in B2B that you never heard about them because they are just, yeah, B2B is not, uh, they will not ever advertise on the street because mm. they don't need to. They have a direct relationship with their customers. Um, some platforms are, uh, are not able to do B2B properly and some of them are really, really able. I think I avoided saying any brand names, but we can, we can do that if that pleases you. What would be um, the number one you'd say to avoid, Cosman? To avoid? <laughs> Yes, to avoid, the yes. number one to avoid. So <clears throat> we get four types of platforms. Uh, we get your classic uh, SaaS platform, your Shopify, mm. for example. You get your classic open source platform like Magento. Mm -hmm. uh, you get the custom platform. Like uh, I have a guy or a company who will build in PHP from scratch a platform for me. Mm -hmm. And you have the enterprise platforms, which are probably out of the league for many, many companies. Only platform could cost one, two million euro, yep. the platform sure. itself. Yeah, sure. Um, so leaving aside the enterprise, because this is a special topic, uh, I would totally avoid any custom platform, like totally avoid, because it brings so much complexity and you become an IT company. You, you will never become an IT company, but you try to become an IT company and lose focus on the business part of it. And sure. You are dependent, I guess. Huh? Yes, yes. And, an IT and company. the big problem with custom is that you never get what's, whatever is cool, let's say, or uh, fashionable, but fashionable in a good way in the mm. e-commerce market, because mm. it's just you and your IT guy. And then it, your mind is your limit. While in a, in a SaaS platform, yeah, whatever a thousand people request, eventually the SaaS provider will build uh, build in the platform. And even if you haven't thought about a new functionality or new uh, 
uh, opportunity. It will be there in the next release mm. because it's just so many people asking. And as well as that with like uh, Shopify or SaaS, right? You can have all of the features that they've already built and then you could pay a developer to build an extra feature on top, right? For a fee. Indeed, um, that, that brings some complexity and some challenges. So the, the shortcomings of uh, SaaS platforms is that you, you have what they have, you get what they have. So this is it. This is the platform. It's cloud-based. You can't change much. Mm-hmm. But then you can change some, either through plugins or additional apps or through custom development on top of it, which, which is the, the, the weak point. Because when you bring another uh, platform, for uh, another app, for example, Shopify. We had a big challenge with Shopify for uh, the search functionality because Shopify building search functionality is not great and you need an add-on for that. Mm. And we we uh, got that uh, add-on and we said, okay, it doesn't matter. The prices are not so high anyway. And I said, yeah, let's just build the be- uh, buy the best one or rent the best one because mm-hmm. it's a subscription model. And then... Our uh, speed score in Google went from 60 something to 30 something. Oh my God. Wow. And it was totally crazy because it was search, but also kind of filter and variant uh, support in the, in the category page. It crushed everything. And actually we couldn't fix it. We, we spoke with the developer of the app and his, they said, yeah, we do some improvements and then it's a bit of our fault and it was like a ping pong and then eventually said, yeah, we're going to rebuild this because we, we can't find a way. And we, we rebuilt it also on Shopify, but we rebuilt it from uh, from scratch. Mm-hmm. So a lot of challenges. And if you add to these challenges of uh, managing the extra apps, mm-hmm. you add custom development, then it gets crazy again from mm-hmm. my point of view. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks for the insight. On that. That's really um, interesting. I'm I'm curious also. Um, common mistakes that when you through your consulting career with e-commerce owners, shop owners, what is a common mistake that you spot almost not at everybody at every online shop, but which is really common where you say that could could have been avoided? You know. Yeah. So two two comes to to mind uh, really fast. One is just what we spoke, too much IT focus, too Mm. much what's the best platform, too much if I would have this integration, everything would change. To a point that, just to give you an example, I was talking to an entrepreneur and he said he was using a SaaS platform and SaaS platforms has uh, these tiers, like, uh, you know, basic gold and uh, these kind of things. And he said, if I could only get the next tier, which was maybe 20 euro per month uh, more expensive, I would have in this next year, this, he called them wave or cascade promotions. So you give, I guess, 5%. And then if they don't buy, you give 10. And then somehow yeah. you increase the incentive in order for the customer to sell, to buy. And he said, if I would could only have that, everything would change. And I said, really? Your business is entirely dependent on one promo mechanism let me just show you respectfully businesses that are doing just regular businesses let's say 5 million 10 million euro in revenue online only who use two promotions free delivery for after a certain threshold and something like 10 percent off per category or per product so the simplest promotions ever in shopify at least and they do a lot of money. Do you really think your problem is, I mean, if your problem is cascading promotions, <laughs> you have bigger problems. There. <laughs> I, I, yes, there should be more problems there. <laughs> yes, in the back. So first is this too much focus on technology. And second, uh, which is deeper, is not enough focus on uh, financials. Mm-hmm. So just not being aware of your gross margin of your net margin of your cost of goods sold uh people just go like people i mean i respect and love the entrepreneurs but sometimes i see this mistake they take all the money and put in a basket and from that basket they pay the expenses and if there's something left then we're happy if there's nothing left yeah we're not so happy but no clear uh, traceability of 
for example, how low can I go with this product in, in pricing? What's my cost of goods sold? So I know how low can I go versus my mm. expenses. So mm. these are the, the two, two main ones. And also I would add one of mine, of my, my mistakes. And my biggest frustrations is that sometimes I'm not able to convince the customer, the entrepreneur, of the right way to do e-commerce business. Mm. I don't know why I'm still working on that, but I, I know the answer to his problems being financial, operational or any type, mm -hmm. but I am not able to communicate or explain or make him believe or her believe uh, that that is the problem. And uh, yeah, they take bad decisions, things go bad and I'm mm -hmm. frustrated because I wasn't able to state my case clearly. I think sometimes as entrepreneurs, you're so passionate and so optimistic and believe that your way is the right way that sometimes when, even when you have the best consultants in e-commerce talking to you and giving you advice, they, uh, they, they just, they can't in their, in their head process it. And they just, oh, you maybe, know, tunnel maybe vision. It's just psych psychological, like mm. maybe they have some issues or their subconscious is manipulating them. Like mm. with some things that they learned when they raised up, um, how to do certain things. So even if like a professional is telling me this is the way how to do this, there are still this belief, this wrong belief, I will do it this way and they decide wrong. And then the, the coach or the, the like Cosmin is like there and saying, what did, you, did I just tell you? And you did the, that the other thing. I mean, it is, it is really like so. And I remember one of the recent ones where I, where I failed to to communicate this was the challenge was the PNL mm -hmm. because the sales were going up, but the profit, I mean, money profit, not percentage profit was going down. And uh, we did, an, uh, we had a, a specialized uh, finance guy uh, do a kind of analysis, kind of putting all data together so we can look at the data, yep. the financial data. And we saw really clear what was happening. I mean, I saw what was uh, clear, but it was only me that I saw it. And that was cost of goods sold went from 60% to 67% in 2011. Mm -hmm. From obvious reasons regarding the shipping containers rate. So mm -hmm. the cost of goods was the same, but the cost of goods landed in my warehouse, in the warehouse was different because of shipping cost. Yeah. And this 7% increase was, of course, huge because it applied on the basis. If you get 7% increase in your SEO cost from 2,000 euro, you pay to 100 or to 200. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, that's life. When you up. have 7%, yeah. was 7 on your, basically on your cost of goods, which is almost uh, close to your revenue, then this means a big number in terms of, uh, of money. And I was not able to explain the entrepreneur maybe i was able to explain but i was not able to convince him that this is the cause of the profit profitability loss yeah and his decision was that he should cut expenses instead of increasing prices or finding way to decrease the cost of goods sold and to my amazement one of the expenses he cut was uh, seo so actually uh, uh, the thing that was bringing like traffic you. <laughs> uh, yes, it's like you shoot in your own leg. <laughs> yes, yes. You, and I said, you want to run them, you want to run 100 meters and then you shoot yourself <laughs> and you exactly. want to run faster. Exactly, exactly. And it, and also, I, yeah, it was totally my mistake. I made the calculations and I said, come on, 2,000 euro per month is like nothing. It makes no difference in, in, your, in your business life. It, it was a 10 million euro business. So, why would you do that? Even if it doesn't bring anything, it doesn't really matter. And anyway, cutting this, but of course, SEO is not something that you see results overnight. You need to wait. You need to long term, tweak. six months at least. Yeah. Exactly. And when you see when PPC brings you results, like now I turn on and I see sales, I turn off, I uh, sales goes away. You cut where you don't see results, and indeed, it is difficult because. One of my mantra, and a lot, I think a lot of business persons mantra is if you can't measure, don't do it. Mm. And the measurement in SEO, it's really long-term and uh, far-fetched. Um, 
appreciate we've uh, been speaking a lot about um, the business side of things with you, Cosman. But um, as we get to the end of the podcast, I'd love to hear a little bit about what are you working on in your personal life at the moment? Okay, so really person, I have a beautiful, beautiful family. I have a beautiful wife, two daughters, and uh, we're uh, enjoying um, our time together. On the even more personal uh, side, I like riding the bike. This is what I what I like the nice. most. I like working out in general and doing sports, but riding the bike is definitely the thing that I I enjoy more. You were finally able to use the mot- motorcycle jacket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, l- let's get bike. I mean bicycle, not okay. bike. Okay, okay. So bicycle, but it, here comes the challenge. I was riding the bicycle up until a few months ago when I decided. I can't keep up with my with my daughter and I need to get an electric bike. I need this like a big thing for for people who ride bikes because everybody thinks uh, electric bike is for lazy people and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah you you went on the other side you know sure sure but actually just for them if they listen just so they know it is not for lazy people <laughs> to me <make, to make laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a lot of fun for two for two reasons and you asked me so i will just keep on speaking on this topic one is that when you're going up yeah when when you get over 40 towards 45 yeah your ability to go up decreases and uh, then you can keep up with the younger more fit uh, guys and girls and you can enjoy the fun together they don't have to wait up for you and when you're going down because the electric bikes tend to be more robust more well built, not built for speed, but built for reliability. Mm-hmm. You can go down steeper um, pass without having all the skills that the the professional guys mm-hmm. have in uh, going down the, the <laughs> pass. Just because the bike uh, really, you know, is as we say, is tolerating you a mm-hmm. lot of mistakes. But I just ha- oh sorry. I, what I wanted to say, if I remember correctly, your your um, daughter is also, I think, national champion. In she Romania is i'm very proud of mountain that. biking so um, i'm not keep, surprised then yeah to keep, <laughs> to keep up with her i fully understand why you need like electro power because <laughs> yes. uh, it might be hard to to yes. keep up with her actually we were doing trainings she was training and uh, because i couldn't keep up i was just taking my car and just driving slowly <laughs> behind <her. laughs> very nice just in some my, a bit more uh, more dangerous traffic situations just to protect her. I have yeah. a vision now of your daughter, you know, panting and you're on your electric bike just by <laughs> cruising past, nice and easy. Um, so yeah. uh, as we come to the end, um, there is one question I really wanted to ask because um, we have a wider range of listeners, but it's always really uh, fun to help out the, the, the generation that's coming up, right? Um, and you obviously have a, a lot of experience and you work with some really great and big companies. And I'd, I'd love to know um, from uh, your own words, what advice you would give to the younger listeners who are starting their journey and um, whether you had any advice for them on um, the things that they should do or just in general, what you would say to, I guess, a younger version of, of Cosman. There are two different things, actually, to your point. So I would say to them, the key thing to change, because they are beautiful, but they could do better, is persistence. I mean, Mm -hmm. take one thing and go deeper rather than many things and go shallow. This, I think, is the the biggest uh, thing, which comes naturally to me, maybe because of my generation, maybe because I'm an engineer and yeah, this is how we will build to go down, to analyze, to go down to the root. Mm-hmm. But I would love to see more in the in the young generation, these depths, just take one thing, you know, it's called the T, T-shaped development. You know a little about many things, but you pick one and then on that one, you really go deep and you become the one for this, mm-hmm. for this topic. And this is the only advice. Other than that, yeah, have fun. Keep doing it. <laughs> Keep it. I love that. Nice. I love it. Nice. 
Well, thank you very much, Cosmin. Um, thank you. S- Sebastian, uh, would you like to do the outro for this week? I, I first of all, thank you. Um, you joined, was, was really insightful today to thank learn you. more about your personal life, about your career, and also about some advices for maybe some entrepreneurs that want to start e-commerce. Um, so um, people that want to speak with you or to want get some consulting or advice, they can come on ecommasters.ro and yep. I think they find all your contact data there or they just add you Cosmin Costea on, on LinkedIn and can write you a message if they want to learn more about e-commerce or if they don't know what e-commerce platform to choose from so they can come. <laughs> they I'm can, their guy. You, yeah. Yes, <laughs> you, you are the guy for them. And um, yeah, I just happy for you that you were here today and um if you want more know to more more about harry visit imaginaryspace.co.uk if you want to know more about me visit re7consulting.ro or just write us on instagram linkedin or harry's i think you are also on tiktok you mentioned yes sir uh, harry mckay on tiktok yeah Ooh. he just started with tiktok yes then um thank you all for watching us and looking forward to our next episode with our next guest. Yes. Thank thank you you very much much again, Cosmo. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.